person who does the like giant Valkyrie cosplay. No. She has the, the wings that like, fold out. Yeah. She's amazing. Hello. <laughs> awesome. I don't have to ask for another greeting because it's a God of War panel. Y'all got to be loud. Yeah. <laughs> uh, shout out to all the cosplayers I see in the audience, especially this like glowing hatchet right in front of me. Hello. <laughs> Uh, but thank you to everyone who's come in, everyone who's coming in. Thank you for joining us this evening at PAX. Hi to everyone watching over on PAX 2. Uh, what we're going to do is, A, have a very spoiler-filled discussion about God of War and God of War Ragnarok. So if you have not finished the game, yeah, this is your warning that you may get spoiled for some things. Um, because we have uh, someone who worked on the game and Ben Prendergast, who voiced Tyr in God of War Ragnarok. So we're going to talk about a lot of things that happened in both games. Uh, a couple housekeeping things. Uh, we are being streamed, so no one needs to record anything. Don't make clips. If you want to make clips at home on Twitch, feel free. Uh, feel free to tweet, though. Tag us. Everyone's handle is up there. Photos are okay with everyone. And enjoy when we get to questions. Have a question. If you do not have one, I will tell you to go find one. Anyone who's ever seen me moderate a panel knows that is not a joke. I will tell you to go sit down and find one. So, so we can make use of our full hour, we are going to uh, introduce everyone. I will go last, so starting down here. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Amelia Herbst. I am the program coordinator of the assessment program at Game to Grow. That's just a really fancy way of saying that I do clinical work, both psychological evaluations, tabletop role-playing groups, and therapy with geeks, gamers, and game devs, as well as folks in the tech community in the Seattle area. Hey everybody, my name is Shana Moon. Um, I am a producer in the games industry, and I was a audio producer on God of War 2018 and a cinematics producer on God of War Ragnarok. Uh, hello everyone, my name is Ben Prendergast, I'm uh, an actor and a voice actor, performance capture. Uh, I've 
obviously play Tia. Don't sound a lot like Tia right now. Uh, I also play Fuse in Apex Legends. Uh, I've been in Hades and uh, a bunch of other things. But um, yeah, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hey everybody, my name is Pro Quesadilla. I'm a variety caster uh, on Twitch. I play anything under the sun. My mom calls it an addiction, but I think I'm just having fun. So, you know, played every single God of War and glad to be here to talk about one of my favorite games. And I'm your moderator, uh, Tony DePass, I for Tier, and I swear that was not a coincidence, I swear. <laughs> um, but I do a lot of variety casting on Twitch. I also do TTRPG content. I'm on Rivals of Waterdeep, and I was on Black Dice Society, and I'm making my own game into the Motherlands. So I am a jack of all trades, master of none, as they like to say. <laughs> um, but I kind of want to touch on something, because this is a thing that always comes up when I talk about God of War or D&D or other things that touch on Norse mythology. How for you, if you, depending on how much you know about Nordic mythology and faith, how did it differ for you in terms of watching the gameplay and playing the game and what you know about Nordic mythology? Anyone can go first. I was not super familiar with Norse mythology before I started working on the game. Um, and then at a certain point, I think Neil Gaiman's North Mytho Norse mythology came out and we were not supposed to read it <laughs> because they didn't, you know, want it to influence anything that happened on the game. But yeah, I, it was, it was really fun kind of discovering it. Also like Assassin's Creed uh, uh, Valhalla came out around similar times. And so it was interesting seeing the contrast between those two things. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd studied some of the Norse mythology um, throughout sort of my acting career for different roles. Um, and then when I came to this, I knew that Santa Monica Studios kind of uh, skewed or took different different viewpoints on it, and I was really excited by that. And so early on, with my discussions with Eric and Matt, um, you know, I would ask certain questions like, why does Tia have two hands? And um, can we incorporate some of my physicality into the character? Like, I have two raven tattoos. Would that be a good idea to put them on Tia? And they were like, no, there's no reason why he would have raven tattoos when we're trying to obscure the fact that he's someone else. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so they, they shut that down real quick. Um, and, uh, you know, so the, but they were fantastic in terms of my, you know, bridging the gap of my understanding of the Norse um, mythology and the God of War version of that. that um, I would say, like, my first, I guess my first intro to Norse mythology was uh, playing a game back in 2013 known as Smite. So let's just say a lot of that myth Norse mythology brought me into that. I was just like, okay, this is pretty cool. And then when this came out, I was like, oh, this is very different than what I've learned with Norse mythology. And I branched out more. But learning so many different things about, you know, like Ragnarok and, the, like, winter and how the story of Fenrir is a little bit different what we know from, I guess, different versions of Norse mythology, it was just depicted f fantastically in the game, so I loved it. I struggled because I actually do follow the Nordic faith path, and I was like, um, Tyr, why, why do we have two hands? <laughs> um, also, why is this wolf not really more upset to see you? Mm -hmm. And I did not realize you actually have raven tattoos, so that's kind of hilarious when you <laughs> play the game and you find out who Tyr is later on. So for me, it was kind of a struggle, and I'm like, it's a video game, please stop this. Um, you know, thinking about that, because especially since, Dana, you, know, you worked on both games, the changes between the 2018 God of War, the Kratos that we meet, who's, you know, newly mourning, his son who does not know kind of what to do now that his mother's gone, and what to do with his father that, frankly, isn't a good man or a good father, and then kind of how that shifts into 2022 God of War Ragnarok and how Kratos and Atreus have to grow up in many senses. Yeah, it was like obviously 2018 was a big change for people who had played the original games. I really enjoyed seeing in Ragnarok Kratos like having friends and, and really having some like deep, meaningful, important conversations, not only about like what was happening now, but also his past. Um, it, it really ended up being something pretty remarkable, I think, just from the perspective of like, you know, we have, there are a lot of like sad dad games, but I feel like 
there was such a progression here of like coming to terms with himself as a father and, and really coming to terms with like the idea that your children can move on, which is something that he had never had to deal with before. So it was really special. You know, you actually bring up relationships. Like the one thing I loved about between Kratos and Mimir, the talk, him calling him brother and just seeing the growth between them two, just growing up, just like, he's like, oh, this brother is it's going to let, he's going to grow up. You have to let him make mistakes, but you can't get angry with him. You have to talk to him. And you know, he had a battle with that throughout the game. And then he was like, you know what? He knows, he knew Mimir was right, but you still had to go through, you know, what you learned as being a Spartan. And you had to come to terms of like breaking those chains of what you learned when you were younger. But, you know, it takes time. And I love that he grew from that. I, as the therapist in the room, uh, well, <laughs> on, the, on the panel at least, there's probably more of us. Um, watching Kratos' growth was just, it was so refreshing, especially playing 2018 before jumping into Ragnarok and realizing that, like, there were times there was just some of the dialogue in the 2018 game that I'm like, come on, man, you're so close. And then seeing him kind of, Fighting with his fighting with his own potential fate, and then you know fighting with Freya, who's also going through actually a kind of similar process with him, and then him helping her, and then realizing that some of the stuff that he's helping her with, everyone else is able to help him with towards the end. And it's like you surround yourself with these folks that kind of have similar struggles, and then you're able to reflect back on yourself, and then grow from there. And that was just an awesome process to watch. Yeah, the the changes in Freya also, or I should say, like the progression of her character into Ragnarok. Like, her and Mimir, it was so nice to to get to see, you know, more of their interiority and, and really see them also dealing with the consequences of things that they had done and, and also, you know, the hurt that lingered in them. I think that God of War generally, that series has always been about, you know, sort of cycles of abuse within families. And I think that, you know, we saw that play out with with those characters as well. And you played and you played through 2018, God of War. Yeah, yeah, I played all the way through and and had research behind and beyond that for the game, and then um, coming into these scripts and the story time for Ragnarok, um, being privy to that that change in Kratos and the change in Atreus as well, and and Mimir as well, and like the other thing from a from an acting perspective. Behind the scenes, you know, you've got Chris, who has his family, and, and Alistair, who has his family, and me, who have my family, and all of us are fathers, you know. And so we're sitting around, and I kind of delve into this, this subject matter, and I think if, if the reason why this great writing and this great team has been able to deliver such a resonating story is because, um, yeah, it starts out as great material, and then we're just, you know, let off the leash, so to speak, and being able to embody and... and play with each other and, and have these what turn out to be real moments on that in that volume there, there's real tears there's really you know real anger there's real jealousy and from, for, for tears from, from tears perspective you know he's he's in there attempting to you know push Kratos away from Atreus or bring Atreus on because we're doing something else here and um, and so yeah, when I first sat down with Matt and Eric, and I was like, you know, I'm so, I'm so psyched with this role, you know, I'm a father, what you guys have done in terms of trying to turn around toxic masculinity is really close to my heart, um, I can't wait for Tia to just like go, go to war and be in Ragnarok, and they're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, you know, and then, we, you know, we went through, and we, they, they did let me know early on what was up, and so I was able to adjust that that was, that was, um, they're watching Chris's journey and you know Chris is one of my closest friends and Mimir is uh, Alistair is one of my best friends and uh, Atreus you know I watched him be a kid I walked in the room and he's like this tall and then by the end we're hugging it out and he's got me and I'm like six foot and he's like almost up to my height so uh, it's like you know there was an actual growth of an actual boy in the show while we made it kind of amazing um, that's actually a good segue though into talking specifically about cheer so this is a major spoiler. We told you there would be spoilers. Um, I don't know if you would like to reveal it. I'll tell you how it was revealed to me, so if you don't know, you're about to find out. But we had already done one session in the volume, and um, I remember went up to Chris, and we were working, working through what Tia would sound like, and 
Um, we found a, a good pocket for Tyr, and he was a little softer, and he was kind of, you know, down here. He wasn't quite deep here. Don't, don't mess with my money. Don't put him down near Kratos. <laughs> um, so we kind of brought him up here, and he was softer. You know, he was the god of peace. And, uh, and so we did this first day on set, and, and, and I remember um, Chris shouting out across the volume. He's like, you know, well, he's the other guy. And I'm like, wait, what? And so I called up Matt and Eric, and they're like, listen, let's have a meeting. And we'd already done one session. So we sat down, I'm like, so what's up? Like, what's going on there? Like, listen, you'll always be Tia. You are Tia. Who we've cast is you. You are Tia. Um, but you're also Odin. You're actually Odin hiding out. And I was like, I sat down. Like, I, told, <laughs> I literally, I just had to sit down. I needed like five minutes to like be like, so wait, what? How, what, how, like what, <laughs> what do we do from here? What am I doing? And they're like, well, you know, you're, you're Odin and in all of his trickery, you're in there amongst the fray, trying to work out what they know about Ragnarok, trying to avoid your own demise. Um, and so you have the, we as the writers and you as the actor have the task of playing two intentions in every single line, scene and across your whole performance until the very end. And so every single, if you go through and play back again, you'll see Tyr, and he'll be in the background looking at Atreus and seeing what he can do with Atreus. You'll see me walk up to Frigg, accidentally call her Frigg, that's a brilliant one. You'll see me stirring the pot literally in the back, in the back of the scenes. Um, and so, you know, for the whole time, um, I was literally terrified for four years that you guys would find out who I was and what I was really doing there. And then I was also elated at the end when, you know, you, then you'd find the real tier, and I dare say it's not the last time we'll see tier either. So, um, yeah, that was it, one of the trickiest performances of my career to play two characters that no one could ever find out about until the end. I will say for me, I was surprised because I'm pretty sure that I cussed everybody at Sony Santa Monica for about two minutes when I found tier in that prison. I'm just like, you mean I've gone through this whole game and this man was lying to me. And then I was like, wait, it's Odin. Never mind. <laughs> it was so really, well done. So the way that they like tell us on the, the whole team about like what's going on in the plot is that we had this whole big meeting where like Matt and Rich basically kind of acted out things. And so that was how I found out. And it was just like a real punch in the gut like to, to realize kind of what the implication was there and kind of, and for me, basically every time, so I played God of War Ragnarok knowing all of this, and every time you talk to Freya, I would just be like, don't talk to her, don't look at her. <laughs> get, get a job and leave. <laughs> and, and so playing, playing through that, having that experience was just like, and then, you know, when the big reveal happens, I'm watching this scene and I'm like, oh, did, did they move it? Is it not happening right now? What's happening there? And then, boom, it happens. And I was like, ah, oh no. <laughs> this is so validating to hear all of this because when the big reveal happened with Tyr, I had to take a moment. I was vibing with Tyr. I was like, I like him. I was like, there's just something about him I like. This is awesome. And then the big reveal happened. And I just remember having to like take a moment to like grieve what I thought I knew. And then when you find him later, I was like, yes, but wait. <laughs> but, <laughs> and then he's like, he's like a different guy. Yeah. He's totally, he's like confident. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. he goes around all the realms. Like it, it was, it was really nice to see that he's, he's not this broken person that Odin was portraying him as. Yeah. Well, they, and then they sort of call me in and they're like, listen, we have to do the, the real tier, like finding the real tier. And it took me a, with me a while. I was like, no, this is the real tier that we're recording, right? And they're like, yeah. I'm like, should I make him Australian? They're like, no, don't do that. <laughs> uh, and so he becomes the god of yoga, apparently, online. That's what I'm hearing online. Mm -hmm. but no, he's, he's a strong character. He just chooses when he fights or not, you know? The, the difference is, is that Odin as tier doesn't have the little accent mark. And then once you get to the real tier, it does have the little accent. And when a friend of mine who's a narrative producer on the game also pointed that out, I was like, oh, no. that is just the most like Sony Santa Monica thing ever. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's also in a clue in the very first line of the trailer that you hear 
which is, um, is it a god of war you came to find? No, you didn't find the god of war, you found Odin. <laughs> you <know? laughs> um, but since we're talking about feels, um, let's talk about missions and moments that kind of hit all of us in the feels. And for those that don't know, the background image that, the background of the image that we have up here is a mission that you can do that is, it hurt me, like, in, in knowing what was coming. And that there were um, husbands who were working on the game. One of the gentlemen unfortunately passed away. And this is a memorial to him and their adventures and traveling the world. And then you find the rainbow. And in this moment, I, I had to stop. I had to stop playing because I played through this game on stream and I knew what was coming. I knew the backstory. I'd read the developer's thread, but it still wasn't okay. And in the sense of this broke my heart, but also when you're Freya, when you finally have your vengeance as Freya and when you see her so broken still over losing her son, those are the two things that really just kind of punched me in the throat. So, yes, and again, reminder, spoilers. <laughs> so, are the other, what, you know, especially, you know, like, what are things that when you played it or watched it or read the script or, you know, because you also streamed your yeah. playthrough, yeah. the things that kind of made you sit back and go, okay, I need a minute. I think Brock's funeral. Mm. Oh, sorry. Uh, Brock's funeral, probably. Um, mainly because there was part of me that was hoping that when Sindri showed up that, you know, it would be this good collective moment of like, okay, this sucks. We made our way through this. We're good. And to have Kratos kind of reach out to him to say something, and he was very much like, oh my gosh, I'm like getting teary-eyed thinking about it. It's like, it's appropriate grief, you know? It's okay to not just be like, all right, yeah, now we're all friends together, but to have that moment where like he showed up he said goodbye to his brother, but then he chose not to engage anymore. It was like, oof, he's hurting, and now I hurt. Yeah. Like, and, you know, just sh shout out to Adam Harrington, who played Sindri, like, if he's watching or if he sees this, he absolutely crushed this role. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like, I remember there was a couple of moments in the, in the volume, I think the one that springs to mind is when he crushes the, um, the soul inside the stone. And I, I'd seen the sides for that, but I wasn't part of the scene. So I was literally just there watching him. And um, just, he was just all, like, he was actually Sindri for that minute, you know? He just walks over, he grabs it, he crushed it. He went out, and you would see him at the end of takes, you know? He would go over and he'd just go and kneel over there and just, like, cry it out. Just, he needed to let that out. Like, he, sometimes he would keep it in and you would see it in the performance, but often he, he would have to go and recover because they asked him to really go there and he's a professional he's a great actor and he went there um and yeah so hats off to him yeah, yeah i would say like kind of one of my that kind of made me just like had to sit back is when you know pretty much when right when brock died and Sindri found out one of the parts where i really had to step back is when they went back to the cabin and you see Sindri's wearing no gloves when I saw that, that man was not, because he's a complete germaphobe. He's a, like, he doesn't like shaking hands or anything like that. This man is hammering away at a weapon with no gloves on, hands dirty and everything. I was like, oh, he's mad. Oh, he's really, really mad. <laughs> and then like when he had that conversation with Atreus, just saying like, the glass shattering, just telling you, I lost everything. That was the last piece that he has, which is his brother. And I was just like, dang, I really have to, I know about I know about losing people and it sucks but and dang oh I'm about to tear up hold on <laughs> no but it's it's definitely something where it's it hit close to home and loss is something that we all have to go through and it's not something that we can avoid it's inevitable and it's 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 like you know it's nice to see that it's portrayed correctly even in a video game so um so there were there were two folks on the team who passed away during the development of god of war ragnarok jake and george and jake was a friend um and his partner sam is a very good friend of mine and 
the fact that that undescribable tragedy became this celebration of of their love and and also specifically of of a of queer love of of gay love between these two guys that was really important to me um i know that it's impacted a lot of people i think that it is really important to have queer representation in big triple a titles and i'm glad that i'm glad that people get to know about jake um because he was a special person and um yeah that that's something that games can do and i think that Ragnarok does it beautifully. It was done beautifully, and I know that for me as a queer person, it was just like, this is not just done well, it's done beautifully. And again, if anyone ever tells you that games can't make you feel emotions or make you realize things and be a better person, then they have no soul. <laughs> so speaking of souls, and let's try to be a little bit more cheerful, um, I want to talk about the music and you know especially the emotions that music in the game can give us because the score is one of my favorite things for Ragnarok and I cannot carry a tune in a bucket but when Blood on the Snow comes on I will absolutely start belting it out um, so I want to talk about the ways in which music in both games kind of worked for us gave us feelings or just kind of conveyed something and what it meant for us as players of the game or working on the game, voicing the game, or when you played 2018 God of War? Ooh, I will say like one of the best when it came to the music is when Kratos in the 2018 version went to go get the Plates of Chaos. Ooh, I don't know, like the chills that I felt when he pulled those blades out of the, out of the, uh, the bottom of the house. I was like, ooh, my body. <laughs> but it was the music that, you know, you just felt like, I don't know, I, I felt like the feeling of everything that we played from the P PS2 versions, from God of War 1 to 3, would just come back from just the music alone and just seeing those blades in Kratos' hand and wrapping the chains around his wrist again, just going to like, this is for you. You all went through all this new stuff, but let's go back home a little bit. So I, oof, I'm gonna watch that trip. I'm gonna watch that scene again when I get home. <laughs> uh, yeah. So as I mentioned before, I was uh, one of the audio producers on God of War 2018. So I'm very intimately familiar with how music gets into the game. And one thing about it is that, you know, it has to get composed and orchestrated and recorded and mixed and all that, and tends to come in like pretty pretty late in the process. And so. There was a period of my life for a couple months where people would just kind of constantly come by my desk and say, hey, where's the music? And I'd be like, it's coming, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> and, and then there was one day that uh, one of the heads of kind of the music department with Sony came in and it was him and me and Corey in the like big fancy sound thing that they have at the studio, just listening to like, I think maybe like seven or eight minutes of just the pure score in just like the best acoustics you've ever been in in your life. And I started crying. <laughs> um, yeah, music is really special. And I mean, the inclusion of like the hurdy-gurdy and, and Bear himself in, uh, in Ragnarok was like a nice little, you know, send off to that. Um, and of course the, the soundtrack in, in Ragnarok was also phenomenal. Most scores, when you're just kind of traversing the world, is one of my favorites. I appreciate going through the different realms and just like the changes to it and it, how it kind of just sets the scene. Um, specifically, battle music at Ragnarok was one of the things that like hyped me up the most. I tend to be kind of picky with battle music because I tend to die a lot. Um, so if I keep hearing the same thing over and over and over again, like as much as I love The Witcher, the lay, 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 I'm like, oh my gosh, stop. <laughs> but I felt more engaged in the battles with the music specifically in Ragnarok. And I think that whoever wrote that was absolutely phenomenal. So I, I don't know exactly how the system came together for Ragnarok, but I do know in 2018, there there is like, there's more than just like you are in battle or you're not in battle. Like 
there are systems in the game that know kind of how many enemies you're engaged with. Obviously, like boss battles kind of have their own thing going on. So there's a lot of work that happens behind the scenes, and it's it's it takes a lot of it takes a lot of people to do anything in a AAA video game. Um, but yeah, that 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 kind of union of like game design and music was it gives you so much more like life to it and it yeah and it does it prevents that like music fatigue that you can get sometimes in games i, I was going to talk about the hurdy-gurdy as well like <laughs> and and shout out to them the cleric um i i wish we had the music when we're make when we're on the floor but it's this which is fine but like you know we had the 2018 music running we knew what this we knew it'd be great and so what I love about that as, a, as an actor, I have my own sort of soundtrack that I'll bring to certain projects and, and often it's nothing to do with the, with the game itself or the kind of style of music that I know the game's gonna have. I think in this case, I was listening to a lot of um, um, Johnny Greenwood who did like There Will Be Blood, the soundtrack to that. That was kind of my recurring theme and that, oh, that's like one of those soundtracks that gets me going for certain things. Um, and so yeah, I just wish we'd have that, that music um, for the actual show, but yeah, we don't. I mean, music is super important. But um, I actually wanted to kind of go back to the thing you were talking about because, again, spoiler, you are playing Odin until we get the reveal. At least for me, and, and I'm, I'm curious how other people saw Odin, I saw Odin like, Odin like he stepped out of The Sopranos. He was a total mafia don, like, I got an offer, I suggest you take it. How did you kind of manage the pretend Odin vibe of of Tyr and then when you saw how o how Odin is like when we when we see the real Odin um I'm, I'm a huge Richard Schiff fan I don't know if, if you guys like Richard Schiff but I was you know in love with him as an actor watching him you know at, in West Wing or whatever so I knew <clears throat> I knew we had a and that was another reason why Tyr's vocal register was was pushed up and maybe a little glassier because it was going to get closer to Richard's voice. Not that Odin can't 100% mimic Tyr, because he's, you know, Odin, but... Um, I, it, it comes from the writing and the directing, and, and, and um, you know, we knew the intention of... Odin's intention was matched to what Odin was trying to do, and we knew that that intention also 100% mirrored, if you looked at it at face value, what the intention of a broken god of peace would do to avoid war to get information, to stay in the shadows, to not want to fight. Uh, so that was the trickiest thing, is playing as God of War. Obviously, know, knowing that y'all are going to want him to, like, pick up that spear at some point. Um, and that was the mission, you know. How, how do you hold, you know, how do you make Tia someone who you think at any minute is going to be like, that's it, we're going to war, you know, <laughs> um, and never get there. It's, like, frustrating. And I know it's frustrating for a lot of people, but in terms of like holding Odin's intention and Tears' intention, it was really pretty simple. Matt and Eric and I would go up into a corner and be like, okay, so over here, um, he's trying to get this information, and or he's looking at the shrine and realizing that Groa lied. Um, Tear would be just as upset. He might let his guard down a little for a second, then just go, wow, she lied as Odin and sort of let slip. But Odin's so crafty that, you know, we can get away with it. And in hindsight, as players, we're like, wait, did he? Why, why is he acting weird at this particular moment? Like, oh, well, he's broken, you know, he's locked away for 400, 500 years or whatever it is. Uh, and so it was, like, fun to, like, you know, find those moments, but it was 100%, you know, making sure that Matt and Eric were okay with my choices as Tia um, and the other actors knowing knowing what was up as well. Yeah. So, Rusty, how did you think of Odin when you meet him that first time in, in Kratos' house when he shows up with Thor? I love the comparison. So it's actually kind of interesting because I was trying to remember what he reminded me of and getting your email where you're like, oh, he's kind of like a mafia don. I was like, oh my gosh, that's the vibe. That's the feeling that I got from it. But definitely someone that was desperate that was pretending not to be desperate and trying to like give that facade off. And I remember feeling that even from the beginning, not necessarily knowing what was going on, you know, from the very beginning, is this is a human, not a human, a god. This is a god that's, very, very, very desperate and is trying his best not to look that way. And I think that that was portrayed through the acting beautifully. I, I think the thing that's really remarkable is that kind of in retrospect, when you play Ragnarok, 
you totally understand why Balder is the way he is, right? Like you look at uh, you look at Odin, you look at Thor, and you can really see, oh, like Balder may not have been the most messed up person in his family. <laughs> um, and I think it is really a testament to how hardworking and how talented and how committed to their craft uh, the writing team is at the studio because you do have this sort of like mafia-ish, biker gang-ish thing that, that's brought to the, the gods of, of Asgard. And in, in less capable hands, that would have been terrible, right? Like you can imagine that like if it hadn't been done with so much care that like you, you could get something really that clashed with, with the mythology. But I think, you know, the idea that these, these Norse gods are so human um, that they, they act like us, they have these petty grievances like us, they hurt like us, um, it is one of the really fantastic things about, about these, two, these two beings. I gotta say, when they showed up at the house, I'd never been more terrified in my entire life. Because <laughs> you could tell just by the, by the actors and the motion capturing that they show that they are not human. These are powerful beings. And if you were in the same room, you'd be like, same, same thing as the trailers, be in the corner like, mm, this ain't for me. Um, <laughs> it was, it's like, I gotta say the team picked fantastic people. This ent the entire team that worked on the game were just, these are the right people because they are portraying these gods correctly. They are doing, like they are given the, the perfect direction. The writers did fantastic with their, with their lines and the delivery was just, uh, spot on just just saying like if these were right in front of you you're just like man i am not i'm gonna be over there <laughs> yeah when he showed up i was like well we're now playing the sopranos and um <laughs> and then just the way that thor works i want to kind of get into specific characters before we do open up to q a because thor sif and Throod, they're all so messed up mm -hmm. But I actually felt bad for Thor, which I didn't think I would when you first meet him. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this man has been manipulated and gaslit and abused because everybody in this game seems to have issues. Everybody needs to go to therapy in these two games, especially Kratos. <laughs> well, to, to get on a soapbox for a second, like toxic masculinity hurts men. Like, yeah. you know, there's the standard that Odin was holding Thor to, and it really broke him down. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I will also say, like, I love Thrud so much. I'm so glad she exists. I'm so glad she's in this game. I'm so glad that Atreus has, like, two really strong female friends who, you know, feel like teen girls and in this, like, really amazing, authentic way. Um, I was so happy that, that this game ended up having as many female characters as it did. Um, and, and even Sif, who has like a relatively smaller role, you really feel that she has been putting up with Odin for so long and she sees the damage that he has done to her family. Mm -hmm. And in the key moments, she, she shows that strength. And it's, I would really love to see like Throod and Sif's relationship expanded on. I think that that's like, really powerful um potentially for the series what i adore about that dynamic is realizing that the family is angry at odin like they of course they're upset about atreus and kratos killing the brothers but they know that they are put in the situation because of odin but they're taking it out on the people that they feel are directly responsible because at that time they can't take it out on odin because that's dangerous and that's how toxic family dynamics are. You're gonna take it out on other people or other things that are kind of connected, but aren't actually the reason why you're put in that situation. And I think that Thor's whole family demonstrated that beautifully. Yeah, because when, um, when you fight Thor that last time mm -hmm. and Kratos actually gets through to him mm -hmm. yeah. and Odin says to him, you're not supposed to think. Mm -hmm. You're mm -hmm. supposed to kill things. It's like, oh, this explains so much. Yeah. And, you know, for playing Tear and the brief time that, you know, you're in the house, you're having those talks, 
where you're watching Tyr kind of like just, I'm humbly serving food, no one mind me. And then you catch that moment when he's about to flip to Odin. When you when you did those moments, because I'm, I'm I'm trying to think of a good way to phrase it without like also just breaking into tears because it's such a hard scene because it it goes into killing Brock. Mm-hmm. How did that feel? Because you're you're doing your part and then Odin appears. Um, <clears throat> well, for one, as an actor, you know you've got to get from point A to point B, right? At the end of the mm-hmm. scene, you also know that for that particular scene, at point A and a half, another actor is going to jump in and play out the rest of the scene. So just from a mere technical point of view, you've kind of got to set the blocking, like where we're going to move, how we're going to do it, what the pace is going to be like, how aggressive or not aggressive I'm going to be as this other actor from A and a half point to the end. And so I did the original scene, obviously without Richard stepping in, and then after lunch, you know, Richard stepped in to, to take it from that midpoint on. And so I had to have a full version of that that was usable, not just for me to get into the place where I thought Odin would be when he finally had an, had enough and was like incredulous. What all it took after all this was for the little blue guy to call me out and to work it out. And this is the thing that makes me just like go for that mask and like, you know, try and get out of here. Uh, and he's thwarted, of course. But I had to play the most aggressive version of what I thought Richard Schiff was going to come in with in order for the other actors who are reacting truthfully to what I'm doing to play after lunch when Richard came in. And so um, in terms of how it felt, I knew that I knew that I was breaking a family. I knew that I was going to be the most abusive thing in the room, in the game at that moment. But of course, we start out that scene with Tia you know, having his come to Jesus moment and being like, you know, I know I've been a burden to you all. I know you've questioned why you even pulled me out of that hole. I have too. Like an Odin's on the inside of this, but it's clear now. I know what my purpose is. This is my purpose. I'm going to go to that mosque and pick it up now and get out that door. One last time, I'll pick up my spear and I will lead us to Asgard, holding the mask. All I need to do is get over there and get out the door and I'm home free. Wait a minute, you damn spruce! <laughs> <laughs> I did not expect you to do that. <laughs> shout out, shout out to Robert. So yeah, how did it feel? I, I all I can do as an actor is try and play that moment truthfully, which is Odin wants to get that mask and get the hell out of here. He's finally got what he needs, and righteous reasons. Any any antagonist has righteous reasons, you know. We all have it inside of us to do something messed up like that, you know, so what is it that we do as an actor to try and push us over that edge? And it's, that, that's greed. It's, you know, it's um, unexplainable, soul-crushing greed and fear for your life. You know, if I don't have this, then I'm dead. Um, and then there's the whole technicality of pulling out a knife and not showing it to everyone. And then, you know, me, I'm six foot, tears, eight foot five, Robert's five, eight, Brock's four foot, like, where do the hands go? Where does the knife go? <laughs> where does it come from? Where do I turn up stage? And so we block all of that and we try and make it work. And then we don't get to do pickups as you do in TV. We go from start to finish. And that's what I love, love about this, this, this process. It's a lot like theater. It's a lot like film and TV. So um, it, it felt the way Odin would have felt in that moment, which is I'm very, very, very close to getting out of here. But I just have to keep this ruse up for this amount of time. If not for those meddling kids. <laughs> um, all right, we're, we've got about 20 minutes left. I want to get in one more question for the panel, um, and then we will start taking, um, taking Q&A. You know, in as much as we can talk about it or, you know, in speculation, what do you think will happen next with the characters that we got to see? Because... Atreus goes off with Angraboda, tears kind of recovering, the real tears recovering from being in the Asgard prison and then dealing with the end of the world. Um, Kratos has to learn to love and let go of his son. And, you know, Sif and Thrud have to deal with losing Thor. So Asgard is also no more. So, like, kind of what do we think is 
is next, because I have seen interviews where they said, okay, we're done with the Nordic stuff, but you kind of just left everybody out here in the wind. So what, do you, what is it you think will happen next? Or if you could have your druthers, what would you like to see next? Don't look at me. <laughs> uh, this one, I pull out my NDA. Her, no, her, this is all within speculation. If you can't answer, you can't answer. Her, Herman Hulse knows where I live. <laughs> uh, but really, I, to be like totally honest, I haven't worked at the studio in three years. I, do, I don't know. I'm, I know it's just a really great team, and I trust that like they're going to do something incredible, and probably it's going to be something that like none of us come up with. I, they're going to continue to make fantastic things because it's a fantastic studio filled with fantastic people. Yeah, I second that. I, yeah, I, I, I know a little, but not very much. And um, I would, I, I sat on this secret about Tia for four years, so you won't get that one out of me. But <laughs> I love hearing the speculation, and that goes to the, you know, the community and the fans at large. Like, don't think that the studio doesn't sit back and listen to what you all are talking about, and and like. Sometimes you get it right, like sometimes you see stuff in Reddit and you're like, oh my God, they've figured it out. But like, as, as I think Eric likes to say, is like, you know, the fans will throw stuff against the wall and some of it's gonna stick, you know? But the rest of us, we, I mean, I just really enjoy watching the whole kind of community um, talk about what it could be. When we released the first narrative trailer for 2018, someone did like a 45 minute analysis of that trailer and I watched the whole thing. It was, it was very enjoyable to do. I I think he got some stuff right, but, you know, obviously we're not going to go tell people that, but, yeah, I mean, you know, people thought that Atreus would be playable, and they were right, and obviously we didn't, like, tell people that, um, but I remember, like, literally, like, scrolling through Reddit threads about God of War while on set. <laughs> uh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I mean, selfishly, I want to see the Egyptian pantheon kind of be the next group. Um, just because that's personally like a group that I, you know, a lot of folks know myth Norse mythology really well. I know Egyptian mythology really well. Um, so selfishly, I'd like to see that. But honestly, I, I have no idea. Watching one of the thoughts that went through my head because of how beautiful the game is and looking at Kratos is I'm like, oh, he, he's old. <laughs> I think it's time for him to like take a nap if he wants. <laughs> so for me, that kind of came through not only in the body language, but looking at his face and going like, oh, sh if he decides that he's just going to take a back seat for the next one, it, it makes sense. So then, you know, is it going to be Atreus? You know, do we have another God of War coming in instead? I would love to see more about Atreus and Angraboda. Yeah. Or should I say Loki and Angraboda? Mm -hmm. Because, and Loki, I'm trying to remember, Loki and Angraboda create Slepnir, if I am correct. In mythology, I'm not sure about in the game, but I would like to just see more of them as they grow up. And do, what does Atreus do with his godhood? Because that was his struggle throughout both games. How does he grow up and grow into being a god and a good man? And I think he was already there. Yeah, pretty much the same thing. I want to see Atreus, you know, grow up. Yeah, he uses his godhood and anything and just strengthen his bond with Angraboda. Then, you know, definitely want to see Thrud come back. And actually yeah. become like you know a full-on Valk Valkyrie because that's her, that was her dream and I want her to see her fulfill that. So you know it'll be like a you know I'm just speculating. I would expect to see like they're on a some type of fight that's about to like end horribly and then here comes through out of nowhere, full armor, powerful and everything just to help them out and then you know that's the new team. So I would love to see more of the, um, to see them grow up and see all see all the adventures they go into. I did think of something. I, I love all the like little bits of Celtic mythology that we get in Ragnarok. Like there's just little tiny, little tiny bits. And that, I feel like that mythology is so underexplored in, in our culture that I would love, because some of that stuff's really weird and cool. And I would love to, to see more of that. I also want to know what happened to the goodest boy, Fenrir. <laughs> no. Because the goodest boy needs to be happy. <laughs> Um, so with that, we have about 10 minutes left. Please line up here on the left. Remember, have a question. Be kind and precise because we only have 10 minutes. And also please be on topic and be mindful of what people can and cannot say thanks to NDAs.
Oh, oh mic is not hot. Oh, not hot, not hot. <laughs> Cold, cold, cold. Hot. Hot. All right. Um, my question, so I, I always love voice actors talking about their development of the role throughout the role. Um, and I feel like this is an even better example of a situation where the internal process uh, What's your question? is very What's your question? Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> was there a point in the making of it in which you changed your mind about who you were playing? Was it Tyr? Was it Odin? Did you ever define that in your own head? How do you look back on the role? Um, yes, there was no point but uh, where it changed, but I was always, always putting Tyr at like an 80% and then thinking about what Odin would want for the 20% so that it never crossed over into Odin wanting more and then it being disingenuous the way I would play it as, as Odin. But um, it, the writing was so good that I didn't really need to worry. Uh, put it that way. So it was all, it's, it's all tier. He's, that's, that's who you got. Awesome. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Hello. Um, one of the most powerful lines of dialogue, in my opinion, was the conversation between Frey and Kratos, in which they sort of Array? trauma bond over the fact that not only does Kratos fully understand what she's going through over the death of her son, but he himself went through the death of a child and that he was the one who did it. I was just curious about your opinions on the dialogue, but also in particular from the therapist's point of view. Wow. <laughs> Actually, you know what's interesting about that is that I think that I was a little conflicted. I think it was very powerful to have that dialogue between the two of them and for Kratos to admit that, you know, this, this is my story. You know, you're right, you don't have access to it, but I'm gonna give it to you anyway. And I don't know if that's kind of what brought Freya to be like, we're, we're going through a lot, this is bigger than us. Um, but I appreciate the fact that there was consent. You don't owe me this. Well, I might not owe you this, but this is important information to have. Um, and I, I'm curious, potentially I don't know anything about the writing, if that was done on purpose. Um, both the joint, can I say this? You don't have to give this to me, I'm gonna give it to you anyway, I'm sorry, blah, blah. Um, I think that was a big bonding moment, whether we realized it or not. So I appreciate you mentioning that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. Um, are there any takeaways or lessons learned you would think that players should get from playing both games? Um, that you can grow as a man. The toxic masculinity is horrible. And you have to learn to let your kids grow up. At least that's what I took from both because without, I think if I had not played 2018 and had popped right into Ragnarok, I would have missed a lot of context. Um, kind of the same thing, but also that for men, uh, it's okay to open up. You don't have to hold everything in. You could just, you know, you have the support group, if friends, family, use it. That's all I'll say. Are there any Norse figures that you would have liked to have seen in the game that didn't make it? Mm. Hell, Hell is cool because she's got the whole one side of her face is dead and one side is, is living. That's kind of neat. I know it's the whole thing. It's like she's their kid, da, da, da. But um, also uh, the eight-legged horse. Klepnir. Klepnir. That would have been neat. I like, I'm a, I'm a recovered horse girl. <laughs> <laughs> I would have loved to see, and I just blanked on the name because I'm sitting at a table on a stream panel, uh, runs the, Heimdall. Heimdall. I would have loved to see more Heimdall, but also not the jackass that we got as Heimdall. <laughs> it's like, could, could, could you have not got Idris Elba because that dude, no. Can I, can I tell, you, tell you something very, this is, listen, this is, the, we're all cool, right? When they first. <laughs> Remember this is being strange. No, I know. We're cool. When they first like told us about Heimdall, about like what character he was gonna be, how he was gonna be, I went to our like senior narrative producer and I was like, we have to make him attractive because I'm gonna be attracted to him regardless. <laughs> and I need this to not be embarrassing. <laughs> mm. Mm. There are dozens of us. <laughs> Fair. Right, thank, thank you. you. So I know that the world serpent, Jormungandr, gets sent back in time. Yes. Hence why this whole thing started in the question. first place. My question is, 
is there any way that you guys can consider that um, Atreus and Kratos actually would have been able to change their fate? Would have been what? Would have been able to change their fate. Uh, are you asking us, like, as fans? Or? Yeah, just a, as fans in general. I don't think so. Yeah, we could change fate. They told us too many times in too many games. <laughs> 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 I don't think so. I mean, I don't think so. Yeah, I think so. Oh, on the same train. I think it would be interesting to see the consequences of if they actually managed to. Mm. Oh, yeah, it would be amazing. It could be fun. Yeah, it play. But in this story, I don't think so. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I love with the ending of the game, it with Kratos, like, you learning to let go. You know where this is go. leading, right? Yes. <laughs> and I realize context is still important, though. So Kratos okay, loving I'm Atreus and letting him you. go. What are some of your favorite things as fans about Kr Kratos' personality traits that are carried over into Atreus, like father, like son? Strength and the ability eventually to apologize and learn. Mm. Atreus trying to punch that one chest. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate how much he tried to mirror Kratos, except in the ways that didn't work specifically for him, just across the board. Um, just learning how to, when he was alone in the, uh, the forest, trying to actually like learn everything mm. from his, his dad, he's like, okay, you know, make sure like stay, stay low, don't do to anything crazy, you know, just, you know, you have to take the lessons that you get for your father, even though, you know, kind of abusive at first, but, you know, you still learn from what you learn. Okay. All good. <laughs> right. We might get through Q&A, we have six minutes left. If it cannot be talked about, I understand, but what reason, if there is one, was there for Atreus not being at Brock's funeral? I'm not being where, sorry? At Brock's funeral at the end. Uh, he left. Yeah, I don't know. He was gone. Be. I mean, if you're talking about, like, a why in the story was he not there, like, No, I think probably he couldn't face Sindri, honestly, after after everything with Ragnarok, like well Yeah. I, I couldn't I couldn't do it. All right. In Norse mythology, Sindri has a second name, Eitri. Uh after Brock's death, uh do you think his radical character shift was also meant to represent his second name in Norse mythology? Mm. Ooh, that's Ooh. a good question. Wow. Uh, for those that didn't hear the question, Sindri has a second name in Nordic mythology, and is his radical character shift after basically Brock dies? Is that meant to symbolize that? Maybe a good question for the writers or for Adam Harrington. You could hit him up on Twitter because um, I know he would have been playing with something like that if he, if he, I'm sure he was aware of that, but he would have played with that for sure. Thanks. Yes, you are the last one. Congratulations. This one is more for Mr. Pendergast. What was it like working with Richard Schiff, being a fan of West Wing? <laughs> well, of course, I didn't really get to work with him as much as I would have liked, because we were the same person. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I did corner him at the God of War Ragnarok um, launch, and um, I'm gonna, you, you, we were fast friends, so I'm going to go see him in his play in New York, uh, which is coming up soon, and uh, we'll have a round of golf as well at some point. Um, so calling him a friend is like a, a kind of like a bucket list thing for me, um, <laughs> but also just like sitting with him on set and just watching the way he works and then watching what he did when he stood in, like when he stepped into the same scene we were doing was kind of, kind of one of those geeky moments you get as an actor where you're like, oh, this is, these are the choices I would make and here's like award-winning uh, other actor Richard Shiv and he's making these choices and like, would I make that choice? He's, he's going to make better choices, <laughs> right? Uh, and watching how close you get to that kind of greatness is um, is really special to me. So, yeah, good question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you all so much. We're going to do outros, but also uh, you have a signing right after this, correct? Yes, if you want to go over to the Q Hall, I've got some uh, Ragnarok posters, some Tia posters. Um, come and say hello. Um, you can take photos. You can sign things. Um, yeah. Thank right. you for the shout out. <laughs> <laughs> Look. I'm a big nerd. I'm in a God of War shirt, so. Uh, but we're going to go in the same order. What are you doing the rest of the con? Where can people find you if you do stuff online? 
I am just wandering around at this point. I actually leave tomorrow, so uh, if you catch me, feel free to say hi. Um, you can find me at Wandering Shrink all over the interwebs. Apparently, that's a brand I've made for myself. Uh, I... Sorry, I just completely drew a blank. Um, you gotta get home to your cat. <laughs> I have to get home to my cat. Also, um, I guess one thing I'll say is that if any of you have ever had like an interest in making video games, like I've been doing it for six years, I'm really passionate about it. Game production is something I like to talk about, so feel free to reach out. Um, I'm very active on Twitter as long as it still exists. Um, <laughs> and I'd love to take pictures with all you lovely cosplayers after this, if you've got the time. Mm. Uh, thanks. Um, we're going to head up to Portland and get some, get in some of the sites this weekend. Yeah. Uh, I have one more panel at PAX tomorrow. If you're a content creator, I'm going to do a panel and hurt your feelings about the realities of content creation in this economy. It will be over in uh, the other stream panel room, which I can't remember right now. But noon tomorrow, that is the last thing I'm doing. And then when I'm home, I stream on Twitch. I do a lot of everything. Uh, the D&D show I'm on, Rivals Waterdeep, is back on April 2nd for our final six episodes ever. So uh, if you see me all around or online, say hi, be nice. And if I already blocked you, well, it sucks to be you. <laughs> um, I have no other panels going on, so I'll be walking around the con and everything. But you guys can follow me um, on Twitch or TikTok, which is pro underscore quesadilla. Yes, like the food, but it's not spelled the same way. Um, but um, the next thing we have coming up next for me uh, on stream is going to be Resident Evil 4 remakes. So if you ever want to see me screaming at the top of my lungs, come check me out. So, oh, <laughs> but yeah. thank you so much, everybody, for coming. All right, we finished two, uh, two minutes early, so yay. Uh, unfortunately, Ben cannot stick around uh, to do anything, but if you like an autograph, head over to the Q Hall. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone at home. Thank you, Tanya, too. Thank you.